Our final session, session today, before we have our, our, our concluding discussions and remarks, is, uh, is, is entitled Digital Practice Artist Demonstrations. Uh, so in this session, um, you'll have a chance to uh, see and experience, I hope, the work of, uh, of two uh, digital artists. Uh, the first of them is Mateusz Hersch Herschka. 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 Yeah. Um, please excuse my terrible Australian uh, accent. Um, Matthias is an artist who shows his work internationally in art spaces and museums, as well as new media contexts. His work has been labelled bio art, new media art, video art, art and science, concept art, and other things. Has it been called other things? Other things. <laughs> other things art. He also works as dramaturg with some of Sweden's main dance companies, designing and exploring new systems for generating movement and he'll be showing you and, and perhaps uh, speaking briefly about two of his works. So please make him feel very welcome. Thank you. Okay, so um, I guess I just show you two, two projects uh, that are ongoing and um, the way I work is basically that um, there is some sort of question that needs to be asked and um, using whatever means are necessary, whatever technology, whatever uh, methodology, uh, I try to figure, figure it out as I go along. And so uh, the first project here uh, is I guess about jumping and the interaction between uh, people and nature. And I just ju jump right into it. This uh, photo is uh, taken uh, in Guyana on a, in the middle of a road. Um, it's a Bedford army truck driving through a puddle. And this puddle is in fact a habitat for fish. Uh, the fish is a type of fish called killifish. And uh, they live only in puddles. Um, it's a very risky habitat, you might say, and uh, it has its advantages, uh, and one of them is that nobody else really wants to be there. And the water is really dirty, and so the predators don't see you, and, and uh, of course the, car, the trucks are driving through them. Uh, I can show you the location of this particular puddle. Um, this is Guyana, and so uh, on Google Maps, uh, you can't really find it, but uh, this location is a village called Anai, and this yellow line is the road to Anai. And uh, the killifish that are found in this puddle uh, would be given a name, and the name is uh, the Rivulus Urophthalmus uh, Road to Anai, Gui 0205. This is a very detailed nomenclature which tells you the species of the fish, but also where to find it, uh, where the original habitat is. And this is actually quite important. The fish themselves uh, look uh, something like this. And uh, I think they are about this big, and they are pretty short-lived. And uh, the, uh, the strategies that you can imagine that you need to develop in a habitat like this is that, uh, you know, you, obviously you don't have to live for a long time, but you really have to produce a lot of new fish and you have to probably move on because the habitat is completely temporary. You know, it rains, you get a puddle, and shortly afterwards the puddle is gone. So uh, the fish have a strategy which is that they, have a, they basically jump out of the puddle spontaneously. Uh, they, uh, they live there for a while and then they jump. And they don't have any particular land ability or anything like that, so, uh, well, they die by the thousands, as you can imagine, when they jump in the wrong direction. Uh, although maybe they have some idea but some of them make it to an, another puddle next to this original one, and uh, so they have a sort of spreading locally between puddles, and uh, if you have situations like, for example, a trail with uh, animal tracks uh, that, that form small, tiny little puddles, then they can actually sort of migrate. And another... Another uh, feature of this behavior is that because the puddles are different, uh, the fish evolve very fast into new species. So there are hundreds and hundreds of species of killifish and uh, they exist sort of in the globe around the earth. Um, 
Interestingly enough, they show up sort of in, uh, in uh, culture, in literature. I mean, uh, if you have uh, these kind of books about people going to Africa or South America and then the monsoon comes and suddenly there are fish on the ground, uh, there are little stories like that everywhere. So these are the fish. Now, the, uh, uh, this particular uh, behavior of these fish and the fact that you cannot really find them in an aquarium shop uh, has sort of um, triggered, uh, I don't know what you would call it, maybe some sort of collector gene or, or something in people. So uh, there is an international community of uh, killifish collectors uh, who communicate through the internet. Uh, they use all the modern, uh, you know, the modern accoutrements uh, of digital technology and uh, they send eggs to each other via, uh, via airmail. Uh, and what they do is basically that they travel to a puddle, they make this field trip where they go to Africa or South America and instead of you know, lying on the beach, they look for these kind of puddles like I showed you. And uh, they, you know, they dig around and they will, probably find fish, and then they take the fish home to their aquariums at home and uh, they preserve the fish. And to preserve the fish, uh, they have a strict ethic, which is that you, um, you breathe them because they are short-lived, so you have to keep breathing them. But uh, the breathing must be so that the original form, in other words, the way the fish was found in the puddle, has to be preserved. And they also give the fish this nomenclature I showed you earlier so that you have these strains which are meticulously documented and kept in people's aquariums in basements. Uh, and uh, as you can imagine, if you start doing this, then you start with one aquarium, then you need two, then you need five. Uh, then you have to invent a way to have a whole row of them. And um, uh, this is a fantastic guy that I met in Holland. And he has uh, a whole room in his house dedicated to killifish. And in fact, the rest of his life is also dedicated to killifish. Uh, he uh, travels uh, uh, during the vacations to Latin America, collects fish, uh, he arranges uh, communications, uh, exchange of eggs, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, and I guess I could just say that, well, you know, it, it, it's interesting for me because I ran into this, this scene, this is a scene. It's not a visible scene. It's not, you know, Facebook or uh, or something. It's it's, it's a community which has uh, actually been existing since the 1950s or so, uh, and uh, they are slowly, sort of growing as a grassroots movement because of the digital media that makes it communication possible. And uh, so there, I have met people in Portugal, in Spain, you know, in in Holland. There are people in Canada, in in, in America, in China, in Vietnam. Uh, and they're in fact uh, gathering a huge knowledge base about these fish, about how to keep them, how to breed them, how you know the metabolic processes work. Um, it's just that they are not you know official scientists. It's uh, and, and but but also at the same time, when you talk to them, they are really convinced that they are in fact. Uh, preserving several of these species from extinction in their basement because. Um, the puddles are gone, obviously. I mean, some bulldozer comes to this particular corner of the rainforest and runs it over, and that's that. So, um, as a sort of comparison, I just um, wanted to show this photo, which is uh, from the Leiden University. Uh, they have also a department which researches uh, fish. And uh, this is uh, here an image of um, a fish room another fish room of one of these killi keepers. And so you can see that there is uh, considerable, considerable dedication and uh, you could say, I mean, the scientific methodology basically, except it's not institutionalized. Uh, I was interested in this and so I spent about a year keeping fish myself uh, to understand why they were doing this and uh, how it was, it felt significant somehow to, to modern society, but I wasn't sure how. Uh, but one thing that immediately comes to mind is that this is a sort of new relationship between people and nature. In other words, uh, it's not uh, the fish as a pet, really, and it's not uh, 
the fish as food or as a utilitarian kind of biological source, but in fact you are in a sort of symbiosis. The fish uh, provides you with a social life, a culture, um, something to do, a reason to travel. The people I showed you before, uh, they run a dry cleaner shop in Rotterdam and uh, actually without this fish, uh, the life would probably be pretty boring. Uh, but uh, instead they have actually a, a new a super fantastic rich life. And seriously, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think they are really enjoying themselves. So it's actually sort of symbiosis. You can say that for me, I, I think the fish has sort of infiltrated a cultural niche in, uh, you know, in, in, in human culture. And this sort of links to the idea of biological culture being cut short by, uh, you know, human progress. Uh, you know that there is such a discussion that uh, animals are going extinct, the, the biological evolution has been disrupted. Um, and to survive, you need to plug into the cultural evolution. And so uh, inadvertently, uh, here is a species that seems to have found a niche in, in you know, grassroots popular culture, basically. Uh, I, as an artist, was interested if I could somehow contribute to this positive situation uh, as an artist. And uh, one, one, one thing I did was that uh, um, this jumping behavior that, uh, we, that I mentioned, it's common knowledge. In fact, if you have the killifish and you don't put the lid on your aquarium, they are guaranteed to be gone the next day on the carpet dead. Uh, but nobody has actually photographed it. So um, I s set up a situation where I could uh, sort of in a neutral environment uh, uh, investigate if this jumping behavior is true or is it really just something because, you know, are the fish scared? Uh, is it because the food is bad or what? And uh, I made some video documentation so I can show you here some different situations. Uh, this is uh, in my studio. Uh, actually, I had several different setups. I had a double aquarium first, but the fish jumped so hard that they hit the glass, and so, you know, to not hurt themselves, I flooded my studio like this. <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, I mean, you know, there's an edit, but uh, this happens at about 3 o'clock in the night. And nobody has, it has to be completely quiet. They definitely will not do it when you are around. Uh, but as soon as you leave the room, they start looking very deliberately for uh, a place to go, sort of. And then really, really soon they will jump out. And uh, what I'm doing is here, I'm covering the site of the aquarium to make a second situation, which is, um, uh, you know, more like the puddle. In other words, you don't have light coming from the side if you are living in a sort of in a hole in the ground. So uh, this is actually a situation which is much more uh, natural uh, for the fish. And there's nothing wrong with the aquarium. They have food and everything. <laughs> yeah, it's actually quite funny. I, 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 I made several of these and uh, it's, it's really fascinating. Uh, so, so that video is uh, when the killifish community, uh, I, I brought it to the killifish community and they were really uh, excited by it because uh, this is uh, something that nobody has ever done. And uh, it was actually quite difficult to do because as you can imagine, you have to set up a high definition camera streaming directly to hard disk 24 hours, seven days a week, and you have to leave and then you come back and you have to look, okay, okay, he jumped. So then you have to go through 24 hours of footage to find exactly where he goes. Um, but uh, the point is that also this is the proof of uh, the fact that the behavior exists, that it's a spontaneous behavior. He jumps uh, whether, he, you know, there's an, in the upper image, uh, you can still argue that it's because of the light or uh, somebody disturbed it. But in the lower image, it's actually the same thing happens. Uh, although somebody argued that the trajectory is different. Um, and I was approached by biologists and, you know, they were saying that this is a real discovery. In fact, uh, I should publish it in a scientific paper, uh, which 
which I might do, but um, in the meantime, this image shows also the technique of the jumping. Uh, this is from another video, but uh, I composited the images together, and you can see um, that he turns on the side and then sort of spirals out of the water. And again, somebody said that this actually looks like the Olympic jump, high jumping uh, technique. Uh, and this is also in, not really something that has been documented. Uh, furthermore, I was, you know, there's a second question, okay, but the tire is driving through the puddle. Uh, why don't the fish get run over? Uh, obviously, it's, it's a problem. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds stupid, but okay, then you start thinking about it. Okay, is it, you know, do the fish simply swim away, or maybe they are run over, but they are killed uh, massively in massive numbers, or maybe there is something about the hydrodynamics that help them. Uh, and uh, I, I was doing some research about how to find this out, and of course, there are these kind of things you can find on the internet where there is simulation software. Uh, and I thought it would be worth to try to simulate uh, a situation of the tire going through water and see if you can see anything. And um, this is from the photo and, uh, as, well, I found the tire that the truck was using. It's a Bedford Army truck and the tire is called the Continental Mill R20. It's a military tire pattern, especially for, uh, for clay. So. Uh, I created a uh, 3D model of, uh, of that particular tire with that particular pattern and uh, I started doing simulations. Um, so this is a sim very quick sort of first uh, example of how I set it up uh, with a sort of ramp and the tire is rolling through a kind of trough with uh, this virtual water in it. And, uh, this is sort of the, uh, the night, you know, once I had figured it out, I made several versions which uh, uses, you know, several hundred million particles and uh, uh, much more accurate uh, modeling of the water. And uh, you can also do it in different speeds. And so this is very extremely detailed in time, uh, at the time scale also. So uh, here, uh, this is the simulation you just saw from below. And you can maybe see this kind of uh, white white line there and when you look at the velocities of the particle it actually appears to be sort of a shock wave that is pushed by the tire uh, and actually creates pressure outwards and the small fish-like object uh, in the way would very likely be also pushed, pushed away and not run over. So this is another uh, image uh, that kind of uh, uh, brings something new to the table. Uh, here is a concept image for, I guess, a setup where you can test further this kind of situation in real life. And um, I actually have started building it. And you can see here, uh, there is a place in Belgium called the Verbeke Foundation, which is a former truck uh, company. And they have a big uh, space uh, with uh, these sort of... Um, uh, whole, I think they call them truck servicing pits or something like that, you know? The trucks are driving over a pit and there's a guy underneath. Uh, and so they had a space with several of them. Uh, and uh, so over one of them we have, project, we have sort of uh, made a project which is a uh, reconstruction of a puddle. And uh, we are using the uh, servicing pit as... Uh, um, as a reservoir for water which is heated and pumped up onto a platform which has a sort of shallow puddle with clay on it and the water is filtered and brought back down. So it's uh, quite a technical challenge to uh, recreate the puddle indoors uh, actually. Um, so here are some images. This is uh, actually a real puddle in Belgium that we sort of looked at to get inspired. Uh, this is a ton of clay in front of a Keith Haring uh, painting, um, actually. So this is, uh, we, are, we are sort of working on it. So this is inside this uh, metal and glass uh, structure that we have been building. So there's a catwalk and here we have put the clay on already with the water. And of course underneath is uh, the water reservoir. 
And uh, when this is finished, uh, we will uh, start the population of Rivulus eruptalmus uh, right here. And uh, I have fish that uh, were brought by one of those killifish collectors from uh, Guyana, uh, from near that location. So it's actually almost exactly the strain from that puddle that we are bringing to Belgium. This is a photo of uh, the uh, Ferbecke Foundation. And uh, uh, you can see the size of the installation. It's, it's right here. And there are a lot of other artworks uh, around. If you haven't been to the Ferbecke Foundation, you should really check it out. Um, I'm just going to blast forward here with the next project, which I call the Open Out of Body Experience. And uh, uh, basically, the idea is coming from this. And I, I guess you guys are all game developers or something like that, so you know already what this is. Thank you. Uh, it's a uh, Grand Theft Auto 4, and uh, it's a typical video game that uses the third person view. And, uh, um, the, you know, the idea, I mean, this is, everybody's talking about this stuff. So you're, you are sitting, and uh, you, you personally are sitting, and, and there is like this little guy on the screen, and you are all focused on this little guy. And this is. Uh, very common situation today. And one day, I, because I like playing them too, these games, and I was thinking, yeah, but there's something about this situation that's strange, you know? It's, is there something that can be done to investigate further? What does it mean that you are sitting there? Um, and uh, it just so happened that there's a movie called Elephant, which uh, uses uh, almost the same kind of perspective. Have you guys seen it? Yeah? If you haven't, you must see it. It's really good. It's uh, about the Columbine uh, mass murder uh, thing. Uh, and in fact, part of the discussion was that um, the people who, the two students who killed a lot of their friends in the school, and uh, uh, there was a discussion that they were playing video games, in fact. And strangely enough, Gus van Sant made this movie, and he uses really a lot of shots like this, which are very, to me, very similar to the video game. Uh, perspective, but uh, f well, when you ask him, he just says, "Well, we, we sort of looked at the architecture, and you know." Uh, uh, but to make a shot like this, or, you know, you need a dolly or a steady cam, and then you have to just frame the figure a certain way. And I was thinking, okay, but what if it would be me walking there, but still uh, I see myself from this point of view? You know what I mean, physically. So. Um, uh, I was starting to look around, and of course there is all kinds of uh, um, video goggles that you can buy in the shops, and they're all terrible. And um, then I ran into this community again, and a community of, uh, uh, for, you know, these guys that fly the airplane, the radio control airplanes, and uh, they have been working for several years on what they call the first-person view flying which is that they put a little camera in the cockpit of the airplane, and then they uh, go, f they fly, and they put on a pair of video goggles. And uh, with a wireless link, uh, they sort of fly their air airplane as if they were sitting inside the cockpit. Uh, and interestingly enough, they, they have actually developed the technology uh, to a point where it's uh, better than the stuff you buy in the shops. And, uh, they have transmitters and um, goggles, and there is an active discussion of what is best to use and so on. And so uh, the, you can imagine a setup, which is this kind of, you know, a dolly of some kind. There is a camera on the dolly, there is a wireless link, and there is a video goggles, uh, and there is a wireless uh, receptor. So uh, I started working on it, and this is a sort of prototype setup where we, you know, we discovered that architecture is important. Just like in video games, you cannot be very complicated. It's, the more like Doom it is, the better, you know. And so um, I started to formulate the project, you know, in terms of uh, okay, the, the equipment is available. You, you can buy it and you can modify it yourself. It's, it's, it's not that expensive. Uh, so the project became really about uh, you yourself experimenting with this situation. You know, like in me, the artist, not so much me, the artist, uh, uh, 
making artist movies or, 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 or having an exhibition where, where you see this thing and whatever. But you, you, you know, not only that you walk into a museum, but also that there are a situation where you can experience it yourself, either by simply doing it yourself this way or uh, running into a workshop where you can do it or, you know, this idea of open, how, you know, an open project. So I started to formulate uh, equipment that, uh, you know, different types of equipment that you can reconstruct yourself. So for example, this is a really, uh, after many iterations of how to make your own dolly, this is a really good version with a uh, handicap trike uh, bought for, uh, I think, 150 euros second hand and uh, uh, an iron bar and just some clamps and a, a video head and it's all quite cheap actually. And the, the advantage here is that one guy can cycle and control the camera at the same time with a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of practice. And uh, using this equipment, uh, I have done several sort of situations with people, very informal, where uh, basically uh, we found these uh, settings, uh, these milieus, and then uh, somebody would wear the glasses for, you know, 10, 15 minutes and walk around and just try things. And what does happen when you do this is, in fact, that after a while, once the original confusion disappears, you eventually, you are no longer in your body, you are behind, in, in the camera, sort of. This, this is a sort of a brain, some sort of brain transformation that happens. Uh, so it is in fact a legal out-of-body experience, except it's not spiritual, it's, uh, it's sort of the out-of-body experience on the street. Um, and I, I have experienced it myself, it's actually quite interesting when that happens. So, uh, I, you know, I've done different things using this idea with different people, you know, and, and so this is a version in Minneapolis uh, using a, just stuff we found locally. So it's again a trike, uh, we strapped a, a, a camera onto it. And we did uh, sessions with different uh, environments, uh, you know, corridors and uh, outside, inside, also night vision. Uh, and I'll show you just a short, short, short piece of video here. So the color footage is uh, just some guy filming us. The black and white night vision footage is what you see, because this is at night. So he sees this. And here, I'm actually not uh, doing so much. Uh, I have two friends uh, working with each other. First, it's like, uh, okay, how does it work, you know? <laughs> but then later he started to get sort of funny, you know? He started to, he's, he's pinching the ass of this guy standing there and going, ha ha ho. Um, Yeah, okay, so, um, so um, this guy actually is a gamer and after really a short time he sort of got the hang, hang of it and um, then he started to sort of reflect on what was happening to him, which is that he basically, it's no longer you, but the funny thing is that to control the guy in front of you, you have to do this. Which is, and, and I know exactly because I've also tried it. It's very strange. It's uh, sort of like your uh, signal go take uh, sort of an extra detour or so. Uh, and he commented that um, my whole body felt like a joystick. 
Uh, this is a, um, a second thing that we did. Uh, so this is a bridge over the river Mississippi. And um, uh, to, sort, to sort of give it an extra edge and try a new thing, uh, we got together with a group called the Minneapolis Art on Wheels. And they um, have devised a system uh, which is that to create uh, large-scale video projections using uh, sort of homemade do-it-yourself technology. So we created a situation where this image, which is what he sees in the goggles, also is projected uh, in uh, mega size on the silo uh, three kilometers across the river. Um, <laughs> And this is a very strange moment because uh, you know you are inside, you are outside, you are you know where, what is this? Uh, so this moment is not fully understood at the moment, you know, and we have to work on it more and see what we can do with it. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, I just thought of what Lisa just said about uh, these sort of seemingly trivial, uh, uh, trivial things that um, uh, spark serious discussion and. Uh, the people who had done these sessions, uh, they all started you know, thinking about stuff like you know, the Iraq uh, footage, for example, which is uh, the morality of the avatar situation uh, came up, which, is an int which I, I never thought of it myself. You know, like uh, what does it mean that you, you are having physical consequences somewhere else uh, remotely, uh, you know, where you're not even there and, you know, and this situation is sort of the reverse, you know, like if you run into a, a flagpole you will in fact get hurt and how that sort of made them think about it. So uh, that was quite interesting and this is, so, so furthermore I sort of uh, formulated this as a sort of open source kit uh, that can be sent away and have people, you know, reformulate it themselves. So this is a, a kit that uh, I'm, I just sent to Sydney. They have it up uh, in Sydney in an art space. Uh, and I'm getting these emails like, oh man, everybody's trying it and they love it and they're doing all kinds of weird shit with it. Um, and I'm just going to blast through the last couple of slides to talk about what I'm working on with the project. I just made a stereoscopic version, which is uh, two cameras and two goggles, which are uh, hacked. Uh, this is, again, from the community. Uh, they have tried sort of the same thing, two cameras on an airplane. So the goggles, uh, this is from uh, Fab Lab in, in Ghent. Uh, I'm working with a guy called Levin Standard. Uh, we took two pairs of goggles and ripped them apart, and then we made one big sort of 3D goggle. And uh, the next step is to sort of recreate what I would call the classic. I mean, we talk about out-of-body experiences, so uh, you, you know, you are floating above yourself. And we are thinking to do it maybe with a balloon, because the balloon is sort of a floating feeling. Here is Levin, uh, he has uh, built a robotic uh, helium balloon that has its own GPS navigation and he's testing it. Um, but there's also the opening for doing sort of do-it-yourself uh, community thing. Um, the, I don't know, maybe you heard of Project Ether. They have these do-it-yourself balloons that they send up into the stratosphere. So you, you have really this kind of uh, floating away experience. Um, well, I'm out of time. This is my website. If you have my progr the program, you can spell my name and you will find me because there's nobody else with my name on it. Internet. Okay, thank you. Thank you.